Welcome to the Diverse Voices, Increasing Diversity and Accessibility in Development Panel. I'm happy you're here. My name is Richard Duck. I'm a launch manager with the Oculus Store team, and I'm extremely excited to host this event as diversity and accessibility are some of the best ways to guarantee that players like me and you show up and support great content. For example, closed captioning isn't only in service, that's for the hearing impaired. I use subtitles all the time in games and movies and everything, because it's easier for me sometimes just to read than to listen. And you can go ahead and laugh at that, it's okay. But I'm also conscious of other people in the room when I'm playing, and I usually want to keep the volume low just not to disturb anybody. And of course, I want experiences to acknowledge and celebrate the vastness and depth of humanity. When I see myself, someone I know, or someone I want to be in an experience, it's exhilarating. <laughs> We hope to show the various considerations as you need as a developer to prioritize diversity and accessibility in your applications. Taking the time to prioritize having an expanded audience can pay off in dividends. Building community, talking to marginalized creators and consumers can open up your audience. And again, opening your audience means a lot of really exciting things. A larger community, dedicated users to champion your game, a bigger group of fans excited about what you're doing now and what you'll be doing in the future. And this requires a combination of hard and soft skills. Broadening your team's perspective in hiring, design, development, and more requires empathy and conscious decisions. The output of this effort positively affects, again, things like art direction, storytelling, diversity and inclusion on teams, gathering feedback from a wide audience, and so much more. And it's work that'll lead to more people seeing that your application reflects the world. Finally, accessibility helps everyone not just those that need it, but might want it for their experience. Adding subtitles, again, I love subtitles, allowing users to sit while playing, distance grabbing, colorblind options, and so much more can allow more users and more people to enjoy your experience and envelop themselves in the reality you've created. So with that, I have an absolutely fantastic panel today. First, I'm gonna start off with Marty Kyle. She's a content launch manager for the Oculus Store, works closely with developers launching on Quest to ensure their experiences have the most successful launch and beyond. We got Josh Boykin, founder of IntelliGame, a game critic, consultant, writer, streamer, podcaster, project manager, and so much more. And we have Hasfasio Hassan. Hasfasio is the creator and lead developer of Museum Multiverse, a series for Gear VR and Oculus Go. And Hasfasio has also founded the game studio Made in Brooklyn Games. Thank you all for being here. Thank so, you. So thank you. Great questions for all of you. Oh, hey, yes. Hey, I'm excited. Thanks for being here as well. And it's a pleasure to have all of you. So uh, we're actually going to start off kind of talking about how you got into VR. So what was your experience getting into the VR industry? And how do you develop for VR while taking into account diversity, inclusion, and accessibility? Marty, I'm actually going to have you start off. Yeah, for sure. Um, when I first started in VR, it was mostly through like academic conferences and academic um, labs that were doing some really interesting work in VR hardware and software development. Um, so I went to a lot of conferences and I think the uh, kind of like overwhelming truth uh, at those conferences was that oftentimes I was one of the few women that were attending. Um, so this kind of theme of needing diversity in VR development and you know overall games uh, has been present ever since I started working in VR. Um, after those conferences and being involved uh, at universities and academic institutions, I kind of went on to work at uh, Sony doing content development for film and TV and interactive media. Uh, we published a few um, VR experiences onto the Oculus store, and then that's how I got uh, to Oculus. Um, for the second part of your question, I think, which was, um, how do you go about starting to build for diversity in VR? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a, a super valid question because of the fact that in VR, we're trying to replicate or build a virtual world. And if our virtual world isn't representative of our real world, where we have people of color, queer people, um, a whole diverse like, set of people and, and consumers for our, our content, um, you're not going to have a representative virtual reality if you don't have these kind of groups present. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, accounting for them in terms of representation, accounting for diverse groups in terms of uh, your developer base, uh, in terms of your users and what kind of needs they have, all of these are important things to consider while you're building VR experiences. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And Hesvasio, it's your turn. Uh, what is your experience getting into VR and how do you develop while taking into account DNI? Absolutely. I started with three friends 
two fifty for a cup of coffee. It was the price of admission for a cafe and a drink. So actually, we started our first experience building it in a coffee shop. I know this is kind of like the equivalent to being in a garage, I guess, uh, in New York City. But <laughs> we all met together and uh, worked on this little horror game I had an idea for for quite some time. What was really cool was our team was diverse uh, naturally, just based off our based off of our backgrounds, and it was really cool. I think it's like one of the parts of like being in the melting pot that is New York. So uh, we worked tirelessly to actually um, make this experience the best that it could be with the time that we had. We were all doing this outside of work uh, whenever we had the chance, and also like some Saturdays and stuff. And it actually became the, like, slowly but surely, it actually became the project that we were really excited about. Uh, so that being said, uh, we built out um, a ton of ex parts for, in in like our newer experiences, we've, we've taken a, a huge uh, role to make sure like accessibility is incredibly important. One of the reasons why Museum Multiverse has subtitles and also is localized in a bunch of other languages. Um, but um, for, uh, I would actually like to kind of talk a little bit about like accessibility in the sense of like access to devices too. Uh, we actually like built this experience back in the old days of VR, actually like the Gear VR old days. And we realized if we wanted to release this on a platform that like people can actually like try out, let's say the equivalent of us in that, in that age, like when we were at that age around 2016, we were going to have to build this out on the Gear VR because of the fact that most people would actually be able to enjoy the experience there. That was actually incredibly successful and it ended up being like the approach we take to make every game in the studio now. That's fantastic. I mean, again, accessibility to devices is super important and making sure more people can play and experience your, you know, your title is fantastic. And also, again, the bigger the audience, the more people you can actually have accessible to your game. Josh, I have a question for you. So diversity okay. inclusion in games also includes accessibility and making applications more playable to everyone, regardless of their playing preferences or needs. Can you just talk about how accessibility, diversity inclusion can all come into play in VR? I mean, sure. Uh, so I'm not a VR developer by nature. I'm a, a game critic, but spending time analyzing games and a bunch of other types of media to figure out how these mediums can be accessible is, is something that's really important to me. The wider a range of audiences, of people that you have that can, you know, consume your game and, and give feedback on it, it helps you tell a more well-rounded, just more enjoyable story as a whole. I think it provides a space where as we get a little bit further past some of the things that feel more like just engage, pardon me, just engaging with the technology, um, you know, the shooting galleries and whatnot, and trying to figure out how do we actually, how do we build human stories into these experiences? How do we give people something to reflect on, a way to grow, uh, or, you know, an opportunity to see themselves in the media they love? Uh, it's really important for us to understand that that doesn't just come from being a good storyteller based on your own lived experience but also on the lived experience of other folks who you might not uh, understand as fully. And that involves having a more diverse group of people who play your game, uh, a more diverse group of people who give input on how the game is created and shaped in the first place, and a more diverse group of people who give the commentary that helps to shape the, the situation as a whole. And uh, I think that when you are looking at development from those perspectives, whether you're working on a game or an interactive experience or a, a narrative, um, everybody ends up winning in the end. That's incredibly good advice. I think fantastic advice. Madi, I'm actually going to ask you this question, but have you focus a little bit on accessibility. So can you just talk about how that can come into play with VR and what developers can do right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, accessibility is incredibly important in VR because uh, one of the best parts of VR is user agency. Like you have the ability to look wherever you want, go wherever you want. Um, you have a lot more control over how you experience the application than you do in 2D media where you're kind of forced to look at a certain you know, square area. You have your whole 360 view around you in VR. So then like what happens whenever you can't, you know, move or whenever you can't look around or whenever you're not hearing things or whenever you're not seeing certain colors, 
um, it makes it incredibly limiting. Like it, it feels like, you know, what's the point of having all this great content in VR if you can't play any of it and you can't use the agency that other people can use easily or, or build in uh, into the experience. Um, so for VR developers, I think the best thing that they could do is probably a play test as much as possible while looking at your game from different lenses. So think to yourself, like, how many times am I using the color red, like, and only the color red to signal, like, enemies or danger in my game? And what happens if someone can't see that color? Can they still be aware that enemies are coming? Can they still fight against them? How often is, like, a combination of, um, you know, mana, stamina, and and health uh, being displayed as red, uh, green, and, and, uh, and blue? in your game. And what if someone can discern between the three of those? Or what if someone isn't able to follow dialogue? Um, just try to play test in as many situations as possible. Play test with sound off, with those colors off, um, or in black and white colors. Uh, play test without movement or without uh, certain controller configurations, maybe simplify your controller configurations. And just try to put your application in as many different testing situations as possible um, so that you can get an accurate understanding for how players that might have those limitations are going to be approaching your game. Uh, and kind of like a part two to that advice is have as many people as possible play your game as well, because they'll probably pick up on things that you don't really notice. Absolutely. I have lots of stories of friends who didn't know colorblind mode was an option and completely changed their yeah. experience after they realized it. That's the, that, those are all great examples, which is actually going to lead to kind of our kind of a big question. This is going to be for everybody. Um, basically, like increasing diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in games is kind of like big and unwieldy, right? We've given some answers already. But what are some of the best practices you'd recommend for developers to take into consideration while working on a game or building a community? or expanding their audiences, or maybe something else. Uh, Hesfasi, I'll have you start with that one. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a pretty big question. And uh, when uh, I think of kind of fostering a community of diverse content creators, I think of how I, like one of the solutions that you can do is actually hire these creators and like, and so we can build out like amazing experiences. Um, this is something, something special happens when you introduce a new really great content creator to a new medium like VR or AR and have them tackle experience, like different problems w through angles that you would have never considered while learning the medium. It is amazing and actually opens the array of possibilities. Um, in com and also, uh, Made in Brooklyn games were a little small studio, so we're not making uh, humongous three-hour games. So uh, most of the time, we're actually building out smaller experiences. And at the end of those smaller experiences, like we actually now have like a concluded project. A um, now that the content creator is now familiar with with like with VR or AR, and now like there is a project that they have to actually showcase for different roles in the future. So this is what I do when I, when us as a studio are reaching out and actually like trying to foster the next, like the next grade, uh, foster the community. Um, basically it's, uh, I try to reach out for, to uh, content creators that I find are, who are amazing, but aren't represented because it mirrors my background. I wanted to make games since I was six. There was no clear pathway to do that. So I gave up for a hot second and then came back into it. So um, th this approach is really cool because it actually has given me the ability to work with content creators from all around the world, all the way to people in my backyard in Brooklyn here. So uh, I think what's really cool is um, honestly, uh, those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. So if we want like this space to be like inclusive, um, we need to like, like the content creators need to be here building the stuff. So when the jobs come in like AR and VR, they'll be ready for it. Yes, the, everybody needs to be ready for this. The future is coming and the future is now. So Madi, I'm actually gonna ask again, the big question, how would you answer that? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So if uh, if there's something, you know, that you're trying to represent in your game and you want to bring diversity, you want to bring accessibility, don't be scared to reach out to communities around you or don't be scared to like educate yourself and make yourself vulnerable and be like, these are the biases that I have. This is, you know, how I 
thought that my game should be, but I clearly, you know, think that there's room for improvement. Can you please give me constructive criticism? Can you please, you know, teach me like how to make this game more accessible? Um, but also take the time to like educate yourself. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure to put on marginalized communities to be the person who's educating you all the time about things. Um, so take the time to go through, uh, yourself and, and read some articles written about people, um, who are, you know, experiencing difficulties with representation or difficulties with accessibility and um, just try to see how you can incorporate uh, those ideas from these articles into your game. That's true. Doing the research yourself is always a great way to get started. And Josh, like, I know you've built a great community of people. Um, I want to get your take on this as well. So how would you answer this question again, like, especially around community? Sure. I think a big part of how you, whether you're building a community that you're trying to aim to be more inclusive, or whether you're working on a particular project, is to think about that inclusivity and that diversity, not as an option, uh, but as a part of the foundation of what you're trying to put together. So when you are, if you're going to ask questions about how do we make sure that this is uh, accessible to people with different uh, types of visibility or different mobility. Like, think about that as square one of how you're putting your project together. I think a lot of times, uh, a lot of folks who are more able-bodied or who might fit more of the more uh, societal norms will go into these discussions with the idea like, oh, well, it would be great if, insert thing here. But for a lot of the folks who are out here who have those things, it, it's not a, it would be great if, it's actually their lived experience. And so thinking about, you know, accessibility, you know, for closed captioning, for um, a number of the things that Maria already brought up, like think about those as the bedrock of how you create a good product, as opposed to the things that we can hopefully put in if we have time after we've gotten feature complete, like feature complete involves <laughs> that diversity and that inclusion. That's true, you don't wanna be at the finish line trying to figure out how you're gonna add features at the very end. I love that answer. So actually, well, I, I would say you're not at the finish line. If you're, <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, but like, oh, I would say that you're not no, at the finish line point. at that point. Excellent point. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> That's totally true. Yeah, I actually, actually really like that one because, yeah, if you're not at the finish line, you know, you can't add, you don't want to stop until you actually get that taken care of. Again, all this is super important. Um, so actually, Hespasi, I'm going to bring it back to you. You've actually, you have a studio right now. You talked a little bit about this, but like when you built your studio, like what were the, like what were the other foundations and things that you took, you know, into account when you're adding DNI and accessibility into building it? Um, I'd like to know. Yeah, absolutely. What we did for our studio at Meeting Brooklyn Games was we realized how important it was to have a diverse team at the beginning of like our first game. We brought that into every other game that we created, uh, whether it be incredibly small to the smaller in uh, instant games that we work on to the AR effects that we worked on, all the way to our bigger projects like Museum Multiverse. And I think it's really helped the studio. And also what's really cool is it's fostering the next generation of content creators because it actually shows that like this narrative is possible with like someone as small as like my studio of uh, benefit packages here are free ramen for lunch every day or something so <laughs> it's <laughs> hey free ramen's always good i love ramen one of my favorite dishes <laughs> uh so josh i have a question for you in particular and we talked about this a little bit um what are ways that narratives can actually reflect diversity and inclusion and of course, this includes VR, but just overall, how can developers make sure that that's something that they're taking into account? Sure, that's a good question. I think people often hear the term diversity and inclusion, and it's just one of these packaged things, they go together, but what do they actually mean? Diversity being the idea of like bringing in a bunch of different people from different backgrounds, and inclusion being the part where we actually make those people feel welcome, accurately represented, provide space for them to be their authentic selves. Uh, it's, it's, we're getting better at D. I can sometimes be a little tough. And I think that particularly applies when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about game narratives or uh, when we're talking about development spaces where people may just be getting a hand on what it means to actually be in a diverse environment or to search out diverse voices to include in their work. A lot of it, I think, comes from having a mindset, again, of, I want 
this diversity and inclusion to be a foundation of the of what I'm putting together, whether it's a small project or a large project. I want to recognize that there are all sorts of different people who are going to be taking on all sorts of new interactive experiences, and I want as many of those people to feel like they have a seat at the table and to actually and to enjoy what I'm putting together as much as you know. For any of the developers out there, like you, you ostensibly enjoy the project you're putting together, right? You want to provide as few blockades as possible so that people are able to go ahead and take part in that. And I think it, it, I try not to get too caught up in the abstract, right? The idea that it's like, well, it's all about mindset. But I think also that idea, again, that Maria talked about earlier, like coming from a perspective where you understand that you have something to learn. Even I can recognize with my audience for Intelligame that we tend to skew a little bit more, uh, a little bit more white sometimes, a little bit more cisgender. Um, and so when we're having discussions or playing games that are outside of my lived experience, I have to be able to make space to figure out how do I get people who can help steer those discussions? How can I find ways to make sure that the platform that I have created is a platform that's being used responsibly. And I think we should all consider that whether we're developing a game or whether we're a content creator or whether we are uh, working any number of roles at perhaps a large company, uh, that we are responsible for a platform and that we can utilize that leverage that we have in that platform, even, uh, even just a little bit to help make a difference in positive ways. That's totally true. Um, I actually want to bring up, this is going to, go right perfectly into the story that Madi, I believe uh, you have a funny thing you want to talk about in terms of like characters and games and stories um, that we brought up last time. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we had a conversation about like, when do you differentiate tokenism versus like representation and, and good representation? And I think uh, like the, uh, the advice that I heard that was the strongest, which was uh, if you have, um, if you could replace your diverse character with like a talking animal or like a magical object that could somehow <laughs> like deliver an important piece of narrative, um, then it probably means that you don't have an, a good representation of that uh, that, that person in, the, in your experience. So like you know, if your if your character takes the same amount of real estate as it would for like a signpost that says like oh a quest goes this way, <laughs> that, you know that's not a, that's not deep enough for people to feel included, and that's not deep enough for people to feel like they're actually seeing themselves and they're absolutely uh, actually represented in this experience. Um, so usually I like to say like the diverse characters you should you should have should have like the same amount of like backstory, thought, concept art, and like just effort put into it as the, the characters that maybe represent a wider majority in your experience. Like it shouldn't be this kind of added on thought um, that really is just there for the purpose of filling, you know, a certain need or just filling a certain need in your game, uh, even if it's not just like a diversity need or inclusion need or whatever. Um, but it should really have a meaning in your game. It shouldn't just be something that's additional. Otherwise, you know, we're going to see ourselves as just additional content. Um, like, for example, um, like as a woman, I can tell whenever a girl character has literally just been, uh, it was written as a male character, and then at the last minute, they're like, let's make this into a woman. <laughs> you know, you can you can tell those <laughs> kinds of things. There's nuances uh, from having lived those experiences that I can see whenever that's being done. So just, uh, you know, avoid throwing in characters like that last minute and after as an afterthought. Um, they should be, as uh, Josh said, foundational parts of your game. Exactly. And again, that's, of course, you brought it up. Uh, you know, how do you avoid tokenism in the games, right? So that's actually something I'm going to bring to you, Hess, as well. How do you, as a developer, how do you avoid that? Yeah, this is a excellent, like, point that I can rant on for hours about. But, like, I would like to actually kind of talk a little bit more about, like, the cause of this. And it's due to the systematic history of representation in media. So how do we solve that? Um, what we're doing at Made in Brooklyn Games to, as our part to rectify this is having more diverse, well-rounded main characters in our story because, in our stories, because those are the stories we want to tell. Uh, growing up, I didn't identify with a huge amount of characters in like popular media um, because no one looked like me. It almost felt like I was silenced and TV has... TV betrayed me uh, after I put so many hours into it. But um, our studio is going to continually try our best to lead by example by telling 
underrepresented stories until either the narrative changes or we close down and run out of money. Hey, you got to keep the, you got to make sure that's, don't run out of money. Please don't do that. I want to see more of your games. So keep <laughs> that going. <laughs> so keep your games, you know, your games are great. Keep it going. Uh, actually, Josh, I'm asking you a question and this is going to be, this is really for all of us. Um, but what are some ways that you actually build and foster community amongst diverse creators? Um, I think that's super important personally. Josh, I know we've talked about this as well. How do you do that? Certainly. I think a lot of times when it comes to fostering community for inclusive or for inclusive groups, right, from a diverse background, a lot of times it's trying to find where people are or making spaces where people can gather. Uh, Game Devs of Color Expo, for instance, is a really fantastic organization and a, a conference that meets uh, every year and specifically centers on the experiences of people of color, though it's open for anybody to attend. And the nice thing about it is that for instance, when I go there as a, you know, as a journalist and a content creator, uh, my, my first feeling, my first thought is like, oh, I can like breathe here in a way uh, that is very different from when I am at E3 or PAX, things of that nature. Though increasingly, those floors are getting more diverse as well. We're just recognizing that the diverse audience that has always been playing games is now more often getting a seat at the table, which is really positive. I think that the more that you can create those spaces, and if you are not attached to one of those spaces already, search them out, uh, the easier it is to go ahead and build the, uh, build the voices that you need and the opinions that you need into the infrastructure you're creating. That's true. And Game Does a Color is also fantastic. I want to shout that out again. That's really, really wonderful. Um, please go to it virtually this year. Um, Madi, how do you <laughs> do that? How do you actually build and foster community amongst diverse creators? Yeah, uh, when I come to communities, I like to always think like, you know, not just how am I benefiting from this community? How is this community helping me network or find opportunities? But also, how can I like approach this community and give it opportunities? How can I benefit, you know, the people within it and, and lift them up as well? I think that um, in a lot of the spaces that I've been in, uh, in the games industry and in VR, like it's it's been a lot of times where I've been like the only, you know, queer women of color in those spaces. And the way to combat that is to find more and like help us, you know, lift each other up and help us infiltrate these spaces that are currently being controlled by like these majority groups, you know? Um, and find uh, opportunities to help others around you and lift them up. Um, a lot of times, like if I'm playtesting uh, or if someone else is playtesting my game, I'll be like, can I playtest yours? Can I offer some criticism on your like game design document? Can I look at your, you know, your code or your assets or anything like that and try to see if there's any optimization I can help with? But like, how can I contribute to this person's growth um, in the same way that they can contribute to mine? Uh, I think that's super important uh, when it comes to especially um, marginalized communities is lifting each other up as we go. Awesome. Lifting each other up as you go. Lift as we climb. Always important. So I just wanted to kind of ask everybody just for a quick, you know, final set of thoughts. This has been wonderful so far. This is a ton of information. It's like a gold mine worth of information. So thank you. Uh, Hess, you got any quick final thoughts that you want to share? Uh, sure. So I'm actually really excited about the future of VR. Like, so I'm actually incredibly excited about the progress we're making on, um, like just the like the software piece and the hardware piece of like headsets. For example, I may actually be able to put my quarantine fro into a headset one day now, and that's really exciting. Uh, but I'm actually really excited about um, as well outside of the game space. Um, a lot of these really amazing emerging like companies that are in AR and VR that are like popping up and making waves. For example, a couple of my fellow Oculus Launchpad alums are actually creating companies like Escape uh, Immersive Relaxation, a Black-owned VR spa in LA, or Barnstormers, a VR uh, baseball experience that is that actually uh, celebrates the NLB's 100-year anniversary. All of these amazing things are happening in VR, and it's truly mind blowing. There's even place. There's even really amazing companies here in New York, like Praxis Labs, who are working on um, using the medium for diversity and inclusion in the workspace. These are just like a microchasm of companies that are just popping out. While like at some point, like like there's so many more that will that are just still working in their basement or coffee shop, whatever you call it. And I'm really excited for those to come into the future as well. 
Awesome. Madi, any closing thoughts from you? Um, yeah, I'm just really excited about uh, the future of, of VR technology in terms of getting more representation from our creators. I think that if we have diverse creators, we can kind of redefine the language of virtual reality hardware and software and kind of make um, these accessibility and representation um, needs of ours into standards across all the applications and across all the content. So I'm really excited to see how uh, content creators are going to make the things that um, you know we missed from those media like TV and from 2D games into standards across VR. Awesome. And last but not least, Josh, what are your thoughts, your quick final thoughts? I think that there's potentially a lot of things to look forward to in the world. Right now, a lot of people are experiencing tension for any number of reasons because 2020 has been a heck of a year. But I think that <laughs> game technology in general has been used as a, a way to help people both escape and process. And VR gives us an opportunity to do that even more so with full immersion. I think that as we think about not just uh, the diverse people who are helping to lead some of these charges, but also the way allies can be involved in centering some of those voices and experiences, I think there's a lot of things that we can really look forward to and be proud of as we come out on the other side of, uh, of some of the things that have been 2020. And I hope that uh, VR <laughs> is part of that. I believe 2020 will continue to be a thing, but VR will continue to be a bright light as we move <laughs> forward with it. So <laughs> I believe so at least. I'm here for it. I hope we're all here, we're all here for it. Um, I want to thank all of you. All of you have been wonderful. So again, you've given all of our audience an incredible like gold mine of information that they can use to move forward. So thank you again for being here. I appreciate all of you. And so thank you. Thank you so much. And so I got to wrap this up, we're going to talk about a little few things. Uh, so if you ever heard of Launchpad, go check it out. Go sign up for it if you want to. There's also Oculus Start. That's a good way to get started as well. Those are both great programs to get you in a place where if you have an idea or you're kind of in, the, in a space where you can make VR titles or you're not sure where to start, go check them out. Uh, they're wonderful. Um, Madi is working on some accessibility guidelines. They're going to be coming out in the near future. Keep an eye out for those. Those are really going to help you out again. Another gold mine. We're just giving you gold mines left and right today so you can get <laughs> even more information. Uh, expect to see us at Game Does a Color Expo. Uh, it's a great place to be. Um, if you haven't signed up for it, please do. And expect to see a talk from one of our coworkers. And finally, the future is human, which means we need you, the developer, to embrace humanity while making your experience. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing how you, the developer, and anybody who's watching this shapes the future of VR. Thank you.